Great. So now, now we're going to take a probabilistic approach to solving this radioactive decay uh, problem that we talked about in the previous uh, video chunk. Um, this is going to be a more principled method. I'm not going to go into a fantastic amount of detail about the principles behind it, but I have um, some supplementary reading which people could read up on, um, which is alluded to through the, uh, through the presentation. Okay, so what is the probabilistic approach to, to, to solving the radioactive decay example? Well, the first step is to realize that the right answer, or to take the attitude that the right answer to any inference problem is actually a probability distribution. So previously, we had been talking about getting single point estimates for lambda, so a single best estimate for, for lambda. Um, and that is inherently problematic. It didn't tell us, for instance, um, how certain we were about that particular value of lambda being the right, right answer. And ideally, we'd like a statistical method to say, I think lambda is probably this value, but here are some error bars. And one way of getting error bars is actually to return to the user, not just uh, a point estimate of lambda, but to um, return a whole probability function that says for any setting of your unobserved valuable variable. So here u is going to be uh, unobserved variable. Yeah. Um, how plausible that setting of the unobserved var variable is given the observed variable as O. So O is observed and U is unobserved. Um, and if we want to compute a point estimate from that, we could, we could sort of take the most probable value, for instance, of, of U given O. So in the case that we're looking at this decay example, what are O uh, and U? Well, just to ram it home, if it's not obvious, U is the unobserved um, radioactive decay parameter at lambda and O, the observed variables are our data sets of uh, decay events. So our n decay events that we've measured in our, our detector. And what we're looking from our inference problem then is to return to the user the probability of lambda, probability density here, given the set of decay events. And a typical example might look like this. Um, so along the bottom here, we have lambda. And for any setting of lambda, we can return uh, the probability uh, density that indicates how lightly that value of lambda was given the observed value we've seen. And I plotted a little toy example of this for a particular data set. And this toy example says, if we, if we zoom in here, that it's very likely that lambda is in this region here from say 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters. It has very high plausibility, high probability. It's really unlikely that it will be out, out here, but there is some probability that it, it is, is out here. So that's the sort of thing uh, a probabilistic approach to inference will look to return to a user a function which says for any setting of the unobserved variable, how plausible or probable it is given the observed data that you've seen. Great. Um, so that's the first realization that we're going to um, return to the users a probability distribution rather than a single point estimate. And the second thing is, how do we arrive at this probability distribution? Well, it turns out that the sort of, again, right way to compute this probability distribution is to use the sum and product rules of probability. So there are only two rules that you actually need to learn to solve or to, uh, uh, to solve any uh, inference problem in principle. That's the sum rule of probability, which hopefully is uh, something that you met at high school. Uh, the sum rule just says, if you have two variables, y and z, and you have a joint probability over y and z, and you want to compute just the probability of y, well, you just need to sum out all of the um, Z variables. So here um, we're in continuous land, so we need to integrate them out. You probably met this if you met this in high school as a sum uh, where the probability of Y is equal to the sum over all of the possible values of Z uh, of P of Y and Z, if these things are discrete valued rather than continuous valued. So this is just called the sum rule of probability. This is sometimes called the marginal of y, so we've marginalized out z, and this is sometimes called the joint uh, probability because 
you have both of these things on here, y and z. Um, so that's the sum rule. That's the first rule that we need to learn. And the second rule is called the product rule. The second one down here. The product rule is also should be sort of very familiar from um, if you've ever looked at conditional probabilities before. It just says that the joint probability of y and z here, so p of y and z, can be written in two different but equivalent ways. It's equal to p of z times p of y given z, or flipping things the other way around, it's equal to the probability of y times the probability of z given y. Um, and all these three quantities are equivalent. So those are the two rules of probability. And what's amazing about this is back in 1946, uh, a chap named Cox showed that using these rules is in fact the only consistent way to perform inference. Um, and by consistent here, what he meant was, if there's more than one way of arriving at an answer to an inference problem, um, then using these two rules ensures that your um, your both both of those ways will give the same answer. If you don't use these rules, you won't arrive at the same answer um, from computing things in two different ways. So take an example from the radioactive decay example. In the radioactive decay example, um, our data are assumed to arrive um, IID independently and identically distributed. So the order of the data set doesn't matter. Um, so uh, consistency in this context might mean we see all but the last data point to start with. And um, we perform uh, an inference for lambda based on almost all of the data apart from that last data point. And then the last data point comes along and we have to update our beliefs about lambda. And Cox tells us that um, the only way to get the same answer by running that procedure, um, regardless of the ordering of the data points, is if we use these probability rules. If we don't use these probabilistic, probabilistic rules, we're not guaranteed we'll get the same answer and it will therefore be inconsistent. As in the order of the data shouldn't matter, but it will end up actually affecting us if we don't use these rules. This was a really important sort of breakthrough in mathematics. It was essentially the generalization of logic, of Aristotelian logic to uncertain situations. So there's a lot of literature about how this uh, generalizes normal, uh, normal logic. And there's a, a supplementary slide that um, I'll go through at the end of the next video trunk, chunk, which talks a little bit about, um, in more detail about what precisely Cox showed. And in uh, the next uh, worked example we do, after the radioactive decay example, we'll talk about another argument for why um, using the sum and the product rule is um, the right way of answering inference problems based on what's called Dutch books and a betting argument. But more of that later. So for now, I've told you that you have to use the sum and the product rules to, to find uh, this uh, distribution at the top here. Um, but it's not probably clear to you exactly how we use the sum and the product rules. So let's try and fill in some of the, the dots here and um, explain what's going on. So the first thing to say is um, there's a really important rule called Bayes' rule, which arises from the product rule. It's the product rule in disguise. So if we take the product rule, let's go back one slide. We take the product rule here and we divide both sides of the product rule by P of Z. You may already know this. These two cancel here and we get an expression that P of Y given Z is equal to P of Y times P of Z given Y. That's recapitulated here on this slide and this is called Bayes rule. And that's going to be the really important rule that we're going to use to compute this thing, the, the probability of lambda given the decay events in the radioactive decay example. Let's just fill in how we're going to do that. So um, as I said, we want to compute this, this thing in here, P of lambda given the radioactive decay events. And we're going to compare that to this expression in here. Aha. So it looks like if I set Y is equal to lambda, and z is equal to all of our decay events here, then I could use this expression to, to write this plausibility of lambda given the decay events in a slightly different form. So that's what I've done here. I've made this association, and I'm going to plug that in, and we get this expression. OK, so let me talk you through these terms. So first thing, the term in blue here, p of y 
y is lambda, remember? So those things are giving, giving us this term in here, this first term. Let's just point out where each of the terms come from. So that should be, should be clear to everybody. And this term here, p of z uh, given y, well, y is lambda again, and z is the decay events. Aha, uh -huh, that's giving us this term here in, in purple. Okay, so that's where these two are coming from. And uh, we'll talk through in more detail what these mean in just a second. I'm just showing you where each one of these terms ends up coming from. And the, the first term, the one in black here, this one gives rise to this thing because Z is just the, the set of decay events. And so it gives us this thing at the front. Okay, so that's sort of procedurally how we've gone between these two equations, just going into math mode and not, not really thinking. Um, we're now gonna sort of talk about what each one of these terms means. And the easy one is this one out at the front. So notice that this term here doesn't depend on lambda. You can think of this one as like a normalizing constant that just ins ensures that everything integrates to one. Okay, so the purpose of this term at, at the front here is to make sure that the thing on the right integrates to one. It's something that doesn't depend on lambda. We're interested in the in the functional dependence on lambda. That was the whole point of this this plot out here, and and the first term doesn't depend on lambda. It just makes sure that when we integrate this thing across lambda, it integrates to one. So I'm going to forget about this this term for, for for the minute and not talk about it too much. The other two terms are really important, and we need to spend some time understanding them. And it's going to turn out that they're um, the following two quantities. This one here in blue is going to be called the prior distribution. And it encapsulates what we know about lambda before we see any data. So it's something we've not talked about so far in this, um, in this uh, video. Um, uh, we haven't, haven't talked about what we expected lambda to be before we ran the, the physics experiment, but it's going to be something that's necessary if we're going to take this probabilistic approach to this. Um, uh, problem. So we're going to need to articulate what value of lambda we think are more plausible and less plausible before we've seen any data at all. And some people say that's an unreasonable thing to do. Um, but the probabilistic approach would say, no, 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 it's not unreasonable at all. When you were designing your detector, for example, and you made a detector which only detected particle events between um, between uh, five centimeters and 50 centimeters, you presumably knew something about lambda when you did that. So you weren't expecting a value of lambda that was say incredibly small, much smaller than a centimeter, because then you wouldn't see any decay events at all. And you probably weren't expecting your value of lambda to be way bigger than 50 centimeters either. You'd, you'd sort of want lambda to lie somewhere roughly speaking between uh, the two ends of your detector so that it was sensitive to resolving what value of lambda underpin the data. So that's the first term. Um, it's sometimes called the prior, it's the probability of lambda and it's what values uh, you think lambda could plausibly take before you've seen any data expressed as a probability distribution. The second term here is the one that depends on the data. This is where the data shows up in this expression. Um, and actually influences the value uh, of lambda. And it's what the data, what added value the data or added information the data is bringing about the data. It's what the data are telling us about the value of lambda, in other words. And this thing is sometimes called, or very often called, the likelihood of the parameters. And we'll come back to this term likelihood in a minute. It's the probability of the decay events given lambda viewed as a function of lambda. And this thing is actually given to us by our model that we wrote down. Um, we'll relate it in the next slide to p of xn given lambda, which is the thing we took a long time articulating when we talked about the problem set up to begin with. We talked about the, the setup of the, uh, the um, radioactive decay example. It was this truncated exponential distribution that went between five centimeters and 50 centimeters, the way we believe our data is generated. Great, so in the, next, in the next slide, we'll fill this in in more detail. But here, the big picture is um, that we need to articulate a prior that tells us how probable our data is. We combine that with our modeling assumptions. And the way we combine it with our modeling assumptions is essentially as a product it will turn out to be. These, uh, this, this sort of term and Bayes rule will tell us 
what the data have told us about Lambda. We product them together. We then renormalize according to this normalizing constant here. And that then gives us uh, the plausibility after observing data of any setting of Lambda, this thing in, in green on the left-hand side here. This also has a special name because it's the plausibility after observing data of any setting of Lambda. It's called the posterior distribution, sort of meaning you know, the thing that which is formed after observing some data. Okay, so that's the, the, the big picture um, and roughly articulates how to use uh, Bayes' rule to um, solve this in a probabilistic way. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna unpack these terms in a little more detail, in particular, the likelihood of the parameters, this, this term here, which um, needs a bit more work to exactly concretely link this to our modeling assumptions. So let's dive into that on the next, on the next slide. So at the top here, I've just recapitulated that, that expression for what the, the probabilistic approach is, that it, you know, is, is using Bayes' rule. And now we're gonna go and fill in what the likelihood of the parameters is. Um, here we go. So first off, um, let's remind ourselves that our data are assumed to be distributed in, in an IID way, in an independent and identically distributed way. And that means the probability of all of our decay events is just the product of the probabilities of the individual decay events. Um, so, so far so good. So that means, you know, there's no interaction between the decay events. If I see a short decay event, I don't expect to see a long decay event next or, um, you know, vice versa. Um, they come out uh, IID, that's sort of a property of radioactive decay. The particles are, are independent from one another. Great, and then we know what this quantity is in here. So we know uh, that this quantity in here, P of Xn given lambda, that is, as I said, the just the renormalized or if you like truncated exponential distribution, the thing we took, took a, a long time to explain to start with. So that, that sort of hopefully concretely fills in how we might go about computing this uh, likelihood of the parameter term in, in here. We just product up, product up all of the probabilities of all of the decay events in our, in our data set. So tick, we've got one of the terms sorted. Of course, this term critically depends on the normalizing constant Z. So Z depends on lambda and it's um, you know, something that we you know, have to compute in order to compute the likelihood of the parameters. Great. Um, the prior, is subjective and it depends on your knowledge and you know depending on what science you might know physics you might know um, and so it will differ different different people will put different priors over lambda and here we're going to assume very uh, a very simplistic form of prior we're going to assume it takes a uniform prior between zero centimeters to 100 centimeters so uh, that's just shown in in blue here. We could have done this in a more nuanced way or tried the effect of different priors. But um, uh, this is uh, sort of one sort of simple thing that we're going to we're going to use over the next few slides. Um, we're going to assume that uh, it has even probability, even plausibility across all of these different settings of, of lambda. And of course, this thing has to normalize. So it turns out that, uh, in order to write the uniform distribution down, you need to do it uh, needs to have probability one over 100 centimeters at any any point of lambda. Great. So um, this sort of completes the big picture solution here. We've sort of talked a little bit about how to articulate a prior. We told you a little bit about where the likelihood is coming coming on. And we sort of talked through the fact that Bayeswell says you can now uh, product these two things together given a data set, renormalize in order to give your, your posterior plausibility of lambda after observing a data set. In the next video trunk chunk, we're going to work through what this actually looks like for a specific data set and see how this plausibility of lambda changes depending on how many data points we see and exactly where the data points are in order to give you some intuitive feel for you know what these um, posterior distributions what these likelihoods and what these priors look like and how they combine 